Philip Freneau is portrayed by Joseph Smith. Philip Freneau was an American journalist, newspaper editor, and sea captain, but was best known as the poet of the American Revolution. Philip was born in 1752 and graduated from Princeton. He was a friend and roommate of James Madison, and it was at Princeton that Freneau found his voice in poetry. He wrote poetic satires attacking the British during the American Revolution. Freneau was a sailor and suffered greatly after being captured by the British. His experience as prisoner was publicized in his poem, The British Prison Ship. Freneau also wrote poems about nature, his most famous being The Wild Honeysuckle. Philip Freneau was active in politics for most of his life. From 1791 to 1793, he was editor of the National Gazette, a Philadelphia paper backed by Thomas Jefferson, which actually opposed the views of the Federalist Party newspapers in New York, backed by Alexander Hamilton. Philip Freneau died in 1832. Ah, books. It reminds me of home, the family library. A father used to say, here, use them freely, for among them you will find your truest friends. And I had many friends, Shakespeare, Milton, Addison, Goldsmith, Dryden, Pope, and Gray, just to name a few. They opened my mind, my heart, and my soul to all that was possible in the world, or what seemed impossible. I remember as a young boy inscribing in my father's copy of The Spectator, don't steal this book, my honest friend, for fear the gallows will be your end. And then the justice will come and say, where is the book you stole away? I was very protective of my friends. 1768, the College of New Jersey at Princeton. Now, I'm not here as a freshman, oh no. I'm starting as a sophomore. And if that's not daunting enough, as you approach Nassau Hall, the bust of Homer guards the main entrance. Let the odyssey begin. My shoes and stockings tight, I'm off to chapel for morning prayers at 5.30. Then study till eight when breakfast is served. Classes begin at nine, the classics, Geography, mathematics, philosophy, dinner at one, then more classes. Then it's off to the main hall to hear my fellow students at orations at five. <sighs> orations, ugh. I'm more adept at using my quill. I felt a freedom here at Princeton, a freedom to explore, to experiment, to expand my writings in all its forms, prose, blank verse, lyrics, epics, and satires. Well, here I am a college graduate and uh, now I'm expected to earn a living. I head to New York as a school teacher and last all of two weeks. Father had a desire to see me enter into the ministry. I did study it for two years, but it was lost labor. It was too restrictive. I had embraced deism. The idea that reason is the evidence of godliness, the universe a creation of the God mind. 1775! The shot heard round the world. The storm has come. Lexington and Concord, like a bolt of lightning and a clap of thunder, has set the wheels of liberty and freedom into motion. I am in New York and a gang opposed to the American cause has approached an unguarded liberty pole at midnight, cut it down, and hacked it into 13 separate pieces. This deed has set a spirit among the Whig populace bordering almost on frenzy. One month later, the new liberty pole, take care, seized from the woods this honored tree. We dedicate to liberty. 
Here may it stand while time remains, or liberty with reason reigns. Let them advance by night or day, let them attempt a new affray, and speedy vengeance will ensue. At least their hides be black and blue. And I'm just getting started. I unleash my satirical rage against a certain General Gage. Rebels you are, the hopeful General cries. Truth stand thou forth and tell the wretch he lies. To arms, to arms, and let the trusty sword decide who best deserves the hangman's cord. Feelings and emotions were running high in New York. Allegiances were divided between Whigs and Tories, and now abuse is directed towards me personally. My attacks are not against England herself. My attacks are against individuals, both in England and America, who would misuse their powers, who would act as instruments of tyranny and suppression, and I will do everything in my power to expose those evils. But I am alone in this battle. Alone I stand to meet the foul mouthed train, assisted by no poets of the plain. I grow weary and sick of all feuds. To reason I appeal from wars of paper and from wars of steel. I to the sea with weary steps descend and quit the mean conquest. I leave for the West Indies. Solitude and silence reigns there. For more than two years, I write my poetry away from the noise of the world in that heavenly, peaceful abode. And yet something, something calls me home. I arrive in Shrewsbury, New Jersey, July 9th, 1778. War, my home, my land where patriot blood is spilt. From every mouth some doleful tale I hear, arson, rape, pillage, and destruction. I am sailing on the aurora when suddenly, British, it's the iris, we struck our colors. <gasps> Pray, pray, is it your custom to handcuff passengers? The Americans, I am confident, never use the English so. I insist that I am a passenger on private business and not subject to capture. You are mistaken. On June 1st, 1780, I am sentenced to the prison ship Scorpion. At sunset, we are sent down between the decks, nearly 300 of us, almost suffocated with the heat and stench. I expected to die before morning, but human nature can bear more than one would at first suppose. Every morning, we are greeted with, Rebels, turn out your dead! Rebels, turn out your dead! It's not unusual to have 10 to 12 prisoners die overnight, their bodies lowered down the side of the ships by ropes like beasts and brought to shore and buried together in heaps. As I sit here in the darkness, I am reminded of a line from Dante's Inferno, abandon all hope, all ye who enter here. After six weeks, I am released. Weak as I am, I'll try my strength today. And my best arrows at these hell hounds play. From this day forth, this shall be my weapon. My words will find their mark with such force, such resolve. I will raise my voice against British tyranny, cruelty, and injustice. I will shed every drop of ink for the cause of liberty and freedom. My poem, The British Prison Ship, is published in Philadelphia by Francis Bailey, whose free man's journal I add my voice to. 
and it is needed. Arnold has betrayed us. The Continental Congress is bankrupt. General Washington can hardly hold an army together. Whole regiments are rising up in mutiny, demanding back pay. These are the times that try men's souls. And yet it is in times of darkness and despair that the light of liberty must shine its brightest. And shine it did. Washington and Rochambeau enter Philadelphia at the head of their combined forces. A few days later, Colonel John Lawrence arrives from France with money and supplies. And Admiral de Grasse arrives with a fleet of 28 French warships. Hail His Excellency General Washington! On to Virginia! On to Yorktown! On to victory! And as the bells of Christ Church ring out their song of peace, I hear a voice inside me. To the sea, Philip. To the sea. And while I'm at sea, something amazing happens. My poetry is now in demand in several parts of the country, and my reputation continues to grow. In 1791, I receive a letter from Thomas Jefferson, offering me a post of translating clerk in the State Department. After a spring and summer of uh, <clears throat> negotiations, I take the oath of translating clerk, and on October 31st, 1791, the National Gazette, Philip Renault, editor, is published. First, I do battle with John Fenno from New York. <laughs> but then it is found out who is the real voice behind the Federalist Paper Gazette of the United States. The monocrat, Hamilton. He has the audacity to anonymously, anonymously charge me with being paid to oppose the government. And then he asserts that it is Jefferson who is the real editor of the National Gazette. Do you see? Strings attached to my hands, wires attached to my mouth. I am no one's puppet. I am no one's mouthpiece. No one dictates to me. I went to the mayor of Philadelphia and swore to an affidavit. Then in 1793, President Washington has had enough of me. Jefferson comes to my defense. I will not do it. His paper has saved our Constitution which was galloping fast into monarchy. Then President Washington really loses his temper. Ugh! That rascal Freneau sends me three copies of his newspaper every day. What am I to do, distribute them for him? My only regret is hurting a man that I have admired so much. And I, I hope he knows that my, my words address his policy, not his person. For want of money, the National Gazette ends in 1793. I return home to New Jersey, and for the next 30 years, I continue to write my prose and poetry. I return once more to the sea, and another war with England. Can it be? For much of my life, I have been a sea captain, an agitator, a radical newspaper editor. I was obligated to speak out against tyranny. I was obligated to speak out against injustice. I was obligated to speak out against anyone or anything that would deny or suppress the rights and liberties of the common man. And it was that pursuit of liberty in which I gave all my heart and soul. And yet, from a state of reason, from a, a love of nature, and from a place of longing, in the innermost core of my being, I am a poet.